Boshu Nishnabe, hello friends. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner, and I have the privilege and honor of being the dean here at the SJ Quinney College of Law. And I am really excited to welcome you um, back in person. How joyous to be here in person and online um, for our 28th annual symposium this year, looking at the future of the Great Salt Lake. Um, on behalf of the SJ Quinney College of Law, it is my honor to welcome our esteemed speakers and our attendees, both in person and online, to the Wallace Stegner's 28th Annual Symposium. And it's my understanding that we're currently at 690 att attendees between in person and online, so I think we're going to cross the 700 threshold. So it's really exciting to have this great group of folks with us here today. As we like to do whenever we gather here, I do want to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach education. Education. And what a wonderful way to come together in a community outreach activity. I also want to thank our amazing faculty and staff who have been so instrumental in pulling today, together today's conference. Um, first, the symposium planning committee members. I would like to extend my appreciation to the planning committee members for this year's amazing symposium. The core group includes Professor and Stegner Center Director Bob Kiter, who's here to my left, um, Professor Brigham Daniels, who I know is in the room. Oh, there, over there. Um, and uh, Segner Center Associate Director, the woman behind the scenes, the woman who without this would not be possible, Jan Nystrom, who is right there in the black and white. Big thank you to those three. And then also Professor John Rupel, who played a key role early on prior to joining the Biden administration. And of course, Heather Tanina, Beth Parker, Jamie Plume, and Tom Mitchell, who also provided helpful input and suggestions on topics and speakers. But of course, it would not be possible without our amazing staff here at the SJ Quinney College of Law. It truly takes a village to put on this symposium, so I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our staff who makes it possible to host this event. You've seen them all day. We have folks who are in different divisions, but they're all pulling together to help with this conference today, but I also want to acknowledge our marketing team, Henry Randolph and Janelle White. Our events team, Chris Monty, Pam Smith, and Sylvia Lane, who's right here in the front. She's going to keep us on time today. Um, and our audiovisual support, Spencer Cope and Sam Mills, who is the man running things in the back of the room over there. Please join me in extending our appreciation for the faculty and staff for their hard work on this event. Also, this, this event would not be possible without our amazing donors, so it's my pleasure to extend gratitude and appreciation to the donors and sponsors of this year's symposium. Without their financial support, it would not be possible to host this annual symposium. Our principal funding um, for yet another year comes from the H. Harold Burton Foundation. It's the founding donor who has prov provided the principal founding for the symposium since 1996. So a big thank you to those of you from the Burton Foundation. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Cultural Vision Fund, which provides support for a variety of Stegner Center programs, including the Symposium, the Young Scholar Program, and our lecture series. So thank you so much to the Cultural Visual Vision Fund. I also want to acknowledge our sponsors, the SJ and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the Nature Natural Resources Law Forum. Thank you so much for making this happen. 
And with that, it is my absolute pleasure to turn things over to my colleague, Professor Bob Kiter. Thank you, Elizabeth, and let me uh, thank uh, each and every one of you uh, who are here uh, today uh, joining us, uh, both in person and online. Uh, we think we have a great topic, uh, something of interest, uh, great interest uh, locally, but beyond uh, locally. Uh, the future of the Great Salt Lake is something that should be of concern uh, to all of us. Uh, both in its uh, economic, its cultural, uh, its ecological uh, dimensions, and we'll touch on all of that uh, throughout the day. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, make a few uh, remarks and then we'll uh, get going. Uh, first, uh, let me also extend my uh, deep appreciation to uh, the donors uh, who have supported uh, the symposium uh, both this year and in the past. And I particularly, once again, like to call out the R. Harold Burton Foundation that's been with us uh, for 28 years. That's pretty amazing. So thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, let me also extend my uh, uh, profound appreciation uh, to the College of Law and to the uh, uh, faculty uh, and staff at the uh, Wallace Stegner Center uh, that make uh, this possible. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I did not extend appreciation to some other uh, individuals who joined us uh, early on uh, for a brainstorming session as we were beginning uh, to plan this year's symposium. So we're quite uh, grateful to uh, Tim Hawks, with the Great Salt Lake Brine Shrimp uh, Cooperative, uh, Linda Freitas of uh, Friends of Great Salt Lake, uh, Steve Clyde uh, of Clyde Snow uh, Law Firm, Marcel Shoup uh, with the National Audubon Society, and Nikki uh, Melanson with the Nature Conservancy of Utah. We very much appreciated their willingness to join us early on, share their thoughts and ideas and expertise to provide direction uh, for uh, the symposium. Uh, <coughs> some logistics. Uh, that's my role today, just to keep track of the logistics. Uh, first of all, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to do what we have done uh, in the past, and that's only introduce speakers by their name and title. Full biographies uh, of our speakers are available uh, at the uh, symposium uh, website online, so you can check uh, that out, uh, moderns of, uh, or the miracles of modern technology. Uh, food and beverage uh, uh, is available in the lobby during the breaks. Uh, you're welcome to bring the food uh, into uh, the moot courtroom. Uh, lunch will be served in the lobby. Uh, additional seating is available in the multi-purpose room uh, down the hall. Uh, as you may have noted, the King's English uh, Bookshop has joined us in person this year uh, and has books uh, from our speakers and other uh, related books uh, uh, for purchase. Uh, they're, again, outside uh, in the lobby. They've been with us for just about all of the Stegner Center symposiums, and we greatly appreciate their uh, engagement with us. Uh, if you need to leave during uh, a presentation or to come in late, uh, we'd encourage you to use the side doors. There's one here in the front, but there's one back on the side uh, here, uh, so as uh, not to uh, disrupt uh, presentations. Uh, if you need a uh, uh, Utah State uh, CLE credit, uh, remember to sign up uh, on the symposium website. Uh, we also, as in the past, have online evaluations uh, about uh, the symposium. We'd encourage you to fill those out at some point uh, during uh, these two days. Uh, it's important uh, to our donors uh, to see uh, how the symposium is received. <clears throat> For our question and answer session, uh, we're going to, again, make use of modern technology Slido. Uh, and the instructions will be available uh, on uh, the screen uh, and are on uh, the website uh, for the symposium. And uh, finally, uh, the usual adage, uh, if you have your cell phone on, uh, please turn it off. And with that, I'm extraordinarily uh, pleased uh, to introduce our opening speaker. Uh, she's uh, the mayor of the city that is named after uh, uh, this great Salt Lake, and with that, uh, let me uh, introduce someone who needs no introduction to most people in this audience. We're very pleased to have you with us today, uh, Mayor Aaron Mendenhall.
Good morning. Come on, I'm the first speaker. You got to wake up a little here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my friend Beth Parker for making the invitation. There's a lot of uh, friendly faces I know in this crowd and, and certainly online. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us virtually this morning because our, our shared concerns for not only the Great Salt Lake, but the air quality of this valley and more broadly the climate of this planet has brought us together in many different conversations, ongoing and some historic. So I, I'm, grat I'm grateful for your ongoing care and your focus today on this important topic. This Great Salt Lake, this body of water is as unique and interesting, I'll say, as our city and as our state. It's inspired art, music, jokes about brine shrimp, jokes about a, a lost whale that lives in a roundabout nearby. And it really sets us apart quite literally from every other major city in the region, in the nation, even in the Western Hemisphere for that matter. I've served in public office for nearly 10 years. This is my 10th year in City Hall. But I've never seen a local environmental issue rise to public and international consciousness as swiftly and broadly as the shrinking of our Great Salt Lake has in the past 12 months alone. With many thanks, actually, I need to cite our great local reporters at the Great Salt Lake Collaborative who have been beating this drum for years. And that combined with the national attention from the New York Times last summer. And that collectively has brought eyes and minds in an almost unbelievable way. I've had mayors from other cities who don't have the time and usually don't ever reach out to me. Um, mayors from other parts of the country call just to chat about the Great Salt Lake. And it usually starts with, is it really true? Is it really going to be that bad? And it's one of the first things that people bring up to me, whether I'm in a grocery store or I'm hosting a foreign delegation who's here to visit. In Salt Lake City, it means taking a detailed look. Actually, I skipped a page in my notes. Forgive me. <clears throat> I want to say hi to my friend and neighbor, Tom, also. Thank you for being an organizer here. I think this attention is a good thing. We need it, and we know this from our past work on air quality in this valley, that when we reach a collective consciousness, we, re we also receive an urgency and a collective momentum that helps us lead on policy and funding initiatives. The shrinking and uh, the crisis that the shrinking poses is a perfect example of our ecological interdependentness and how much is at stake, interdependence, sorry. I think a lot of us grew up appreciating the Great Salt Lake because of its, our capital city's namesake or because of Robert Smithson's incredible spiral jetty or maybe even as a third grade source of pride when we learned that it is the largest inland body of salt water. Actually, uh, some of the folks here today may tell us it is no longer, but it is the largest in the Western Hemisphere and, one, and the most saline, one of the most saline inland bodies of water in the entire world. And even though these are all amazing attributes, our science community has long known and stressed to us that the health of many millions of birds and millions of people living along the Wasatch Front and far beyond it is directly tied to the health of the Great Salt Lake. I know other speakers here today and tomorrow will we'll get into greater detail about the hydrology, the Pacific Flyway, and a number of consequences that really sound a lot like biblical plagues, but are tragically truthful. What I want to stress is that elected leaders and that as residents who call ourselves Salt Lakers, we live in this bowl-shaped valley that already traps air pollution and we cannot afford in any measure to wait this out. We have to act because too much is on the line. History will judge us certainly for the choices we make and we don't make about the Great Salt Lake. But even before that, it won't even have to be our grandkids that judge us. We will be able to judge ourselves. That's how short the timeline is. 
In Salt Lake City, that means taking a detailed look at our government's use of water in every facility, whether it's a library, police substation, city hall, public utility building, and in every park, even at the cemetery, and conducting a detailed assessment of every irrigation system, every water fountain, and every green space we own. It means getting smarter, getting more creative, and identifying our opportunities to do better, all as part of an aggressive and coordinated strategy. It means implementing a temporary drought surcharge on the biggest water consumers, and that will encourage reductions in our outdoor watering and quite frankly, help us replace the lost revenue from the conservation you've already done. It means authorizing our public utilities department run by the amazing Laura Briefer, who I know will be a part of these discussions um, in the coming days, but authorizing them to file the necessary water right documentation at the state that amounts to an annual protection of nearly 13 billion gallons of water from our city to the lake and to ensure that water is flowing to the lake in perpetuity. It means residents, businesses, and institutions within Salt Lake City's water service area collectively working to reduce our consumption by more than 15% or 2.9 billion gallons of water last year alone. And it means doing it again this year. Of course, Salt Lake City is only one small sliver of influence on the lake. We need bold action from the state as well. I've been encouraged by incentives to replace grass lawns and funding for wetlands preservation, the creation of a new water commissioner who will coordinate various water conservation efforts in a welcome, is a welcome change in the state, as well as the major news we just learned yesterday that the LDS Church is donating 5,700 water shares which is about 20,000 acre feet, yes, in perpetuity. That water amount is about the size of Little Dell Reservoir. These are important and critical steps and we have to take them now. And we need more. We can't wait. We can't hope for another record-breaking snowfall every year. So much is riding on the survival of this lake. As it shrinks, so does the viability of the things that we love and we depend upon. Industry, wildlife, tourism, snowpack, and clean air. It will take a collaboration on a scale larger than anything we've seen. But there is hope that through resources, education, conservation, and collaboration with brilliant minds like those that are gathered here today, we can save the Great Salt Lake. I thank you for being part of that collective and burgeoning momentum of will and action. I stand with you. Salt Lake City stands ready to learn, to change, to invest, and to do whatever we can for our part to save this lake whose namesake we are honored to carry. Thank you for having me today. Mayor Mendenhall, uh, thank you for that heartfelt uh, uh, talk to set the stage for us uh, and to remind us uh, exactly what is uh, at stake as we proceed to examine the future of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, and to get us uh, uh, into uh, some of the scientific and other uh, concerns, uh, we have someone who should be familiar to most in this audience. Uh, he's been an outspoken uh, spokesperson uh, on uh, the uh, uh, question of uh, what's uh, likely to happen uh, if we don't get enough water in uh, the lake. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Perry. He's a professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences uh, here at uh, the University of Utah. Uh, he will frame the problem, the causes and consequences of a shrinking Great Salt Lake. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Wow, it's great to see so many people here who care about the future of Great Salt Lake and all of the residents that uh, live along here. It's really difficult to contemplate life without Great Salt Lake. Yet, due to a 
unsustainable water diversion, drought, and climate change, we're forced to do just that. Great Salt Lake is arguably the most important ecological oasis in the Western US. And the Saline Lake, its islands, and the surrounding wetlands support by biologically diverse ecosystem that serves as a critical stopover and staging area for an estimated 10 million migratory birds each year. In addition, the lake is a recreational retreat for boaters, swimmers, bird watchers, photographers, stargazers, artists, hikers, mountain bikers, bird watchers, mountain bikers, duck hunters, and campers. <laughs> um, Great Salt Lake contributes substantially to our local economy and gives rise to our reputation for the greatest snow on earth. The lake also holds great cultural significance to both the settlers who declared that this is the right place and the, um, and, and the uh, Ute, Shoshone, Goshute, and Paiute tribes who have called this region home for millennia. Whether Salt Lake City and other residents along the Wasatch Front realize it or not, our very existence is intertwined with the fate of our namesake. To contemplate the future of Great Salt Lake, we need to first understand its origin. During the last ice age, uh, which peaked about 18,000 years ago, temperatures in our region were as much as five degrees Celsius or nine degrees Fahrenheit uh, colder than they are today. And paleoscientists have used a wide variety of proxies and computer modeling to establish that the climate in our region was also somewhat drier back then. Evaporation rates, which are greatly influenced by temperature, were also substantially less than they are today. And the net impact of that, these competing processes, was water accumulation in the lowland areas of the Great Basin and the formation of Lake Bonneville. At its peak, Lake Bonneville was about 980 feet deep. You would be underwater right at this location right now if you were here 18,000 years ago. And Lake Bonneville had a surface area of almost 20,000 square miles, making it roughly the size of Lake Michigan. Shortly after the last glacial maximum, Lake Bonneville filled to capacity and began overflowing to Red Rock Pass in Idaho. The outflow from that lake quickly eroded the unconsolidated material uh, near the pass and unleashed a torrent of water, which flowed down the Marsh River Valley to the Snake River. The Bonneville flood, as it is known, uh, is the second largest flood in geologic history, and it released almost 1,200 cubic miles of water within a period of weeks or months. And it permanently drained more than 350 feet from Lake Bonneville. As the climate has warmed at the end of the last ice age, the evaporation rates increased. And over time, Lake Bonneville gradually receded, with Great Salt Lake being the, lone, uh, the largest remnant. As the water evaporated, the lake transformed from a freshwater ecosystem to a saline ecosystem. For thousands of years, Great Salt Lake has waxed and waned in response to annual and decadal precipitation patterns. As a terminal basin lake with no outlet to the ocean, its elevation is controlled by the relative inflow and outflow of the lake. The inflow is a combination of the direct precipitation and the stream flow that comes into the lake as well as a little bit of groundwater that comes in. The outflow is dominated by evaporation. In the modern age, their anthropogenic activities, uh, such as mineral extraction, have also created an additional outflow pathway. On an annual time scale, the lake breathes. It rises in the spring with the snow melt and declines in the summer and fall due to evaporation. On decadal time scales, it equilibrates with the prevailing climatic conditions. Uh, when the system is in equilibrium, uh, higher than normal amounts of precipitation will cause the lake to rise, and lower than normal amount of precipitation will cause the lake to shrink. The elevation of the Great Salt Lake has been monitored continuously since 1848, basically showing how important it has been to uh, the pioneers and everybody since. And although the average elevation of the lake has been 4,199 feet uh, above sea level over the last 125 years, it's experienced significant decadal variations. In the 1980s, a series of massive snow years caused the lake to rise, uh, and it reached its contemporary high of 4,210 feet. Uh, after the peak in 1987, there's been a clear and sustained downward trend in lake elevation. 
Measurements from last year uh, indicate that 2022 had the lowest annual elevation in recorded history. The dramatic decrease in lake surface area is evident in these time-lapse images from Google Earth. quite the dramatic transformation. However, the situation in 2022 was even more dire when the lake elevation dropped to 4,188.8 feet last November. This image shows that Farmington Bay and Bear River Bay and the southeast and northeast quadrants of the lake respectively are completely dried up with the exception of small river channels for the Jordan and the Bear Rivers. The area of the exposed lake bed now exceeds 800 square miles uh, for comparison purposes, 800 square miles is larger than the island of Maui in Hawaii and is roughly half the size of the smallest state in the nation, Rhode Island. Something is clearly amiss with Great Salt Lake, and no one encapsulates that better than uh, our own Pat Bagley, an award-winning editorial cartoonist for the Salt Lake Tribune. So why is Great Salt Lake shrinking? Well, there are basically three reasons, climate change, drought, and water diversion. As the climate warms, evaporation rates increase, making it more difficult to keep water in the lake. Uh, we're also in the midst of the worst mega drought in the last 2,000 years, which has led to paltry snowpacks over most of the last 20 years. Lastly, more than 2 million acre feet of water per year are depleted from the tributary streams and are used for other purposes. Determining the relative contribution of each of these processes to the declining lake level is a complicated endeavor. However, the Great Salt Lake Strike Team, which is formed at the request of state legislators, brings together experts in public policy, hydrology, water management, uh, climatology, and dust to provide an impartial, data-informed, and solution-oriented support for Utah decision makers. Membership of the Great Salt Lake Strike Team includes myself, uh, other members of faculty from the U University of Utah and Utah State University, as well as state government officials from the Department of Natural Resources, the Department of Agricultural and Food, uh, and the Division of Environmental Quality, the Division of Water Resources, the Division of Water Rights, and the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. The next few slides are taken from the Great Salt Lake Strike Team Policy Assessment Report, which was published in February of 2023. So how much has climate change uh, impacted the Great Salt Lake? Well, if you look at the mean air temperature for northern Utah over the last 125 years, you can see that there's no trend up until the early 1980s. And after that, there's been a clear increase in temperature in the region. And the experts from the strike team have determined that this temperature increase explains about 8 to 11 percent of the water loss from the Great Salt Lake over the last 40 years. Although there is considerable variability in precipitation in uh, northern uh, Utah, uh, there has been no discernible long-term trend in precipitation until the mega drought that has been the last 20 years. And the Great Salt Lake Strike Team experts have determined that this mega drought ha has explains about 15 to 23 percent of water loss from Great Salt Lake over that same time period. Water diverted from tributary streams will lead to reductions in the measured stream flow. The Bear, Weber, and Jordan Rivers have all experienced decreased stream flow over the last 125 years. The Bear River, which delivers uh, about 50% of water to Great Salt Lake, has seen a decline of nearly 38% over that time period. The Weber, the, the Weber River, uh, which delivers about 20% of water to Great Salt Lake, has seen an even more dramatic stream flow decrease during that time period. The Jordan River, which flows through our valley, uh, has only seen a very modest decrease during that same time period. And overall, the experts from the Great Salt Lake Strike Team uh, have uh, determined that natural and human consumptive use explains 67 to 73 percent of our current water loss from Great Salt Lake. That's a good thing and a bad thing. 
It means that we're not, the, the problems are not being caused by existential threats that we have no control over. It means that the future of the Great Salt Lake is actually within our power to fix. So what is the water being used for? Well, uh, it's being used uh, for um, agriculture. Two thirds of the water depletion is being used for agricultural purposes and more than half of that is used to grow alfalfa and hay. Uh, cities and industry uh, use an additional 18% and, and uh, mineral extraction uses another 8%. So the water is being put to good use, but we're just simply using too much of it for the long-term sustainability of the Great Salt Lake. So what are the consequences of the shrinking Great Salt Lake? Well, I'd like to frame it in a series of tipping points of things that can happen uh, as the lake shrinks. And the first of those tipping points was the dust. Uh, I started noticing dust coming off the Great Salt Lake all the way back in 2012. The next one was recreation. Uh, they pulled the last boats off of uh, Great Salt Lake in 2022, ending a long history of recreation. In terms of industry, uh, industry is struggling right now, the mineral extraction industry, uh, but also ski industry potentially. And if we continue down this path, we, we risk the ecological collapse and the death of millions of birds along the way. And if we don't do anything and continue business as usual, uh, within five years, the lake as we know it could be dead. That's what we face. The Division of uh, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands put together this uh, elevation matrix, which looks at how different levels of the Great Salt Lake have impacts. Uh, so they have established an optimum level of range between 4,198 and 4,205 feet, where the lake seems to be operating at a healthy ecosystem. Uh, when the lake gets too high, it causes flooding and other issues. But as the lake continues to shrink, we get into more and more dire consequences. And right now you can see that we are in the most extreme uh, red zone where we're essentially in unprecedented uh, potential uh, consequences. So why am I here today? I'm here to talk about the dust. I'm an atmospheric scientist. I've been studying dust uh, for 30 years and spent the last seven years trying to understand dust from the Great Salt Lake. And give you an idea about what we're looking at, here is an image, a uh, time lapse from the University of Utah looking at downtown. The Great Salt Lake is off to the right. And this happens to be a day when we have a cold front coming through and it picks up dust off the Great Salt Lake and moves it into our city. The state capitol disappears, downtown disappears, visibility is less than a mile, and we're all breathing that dust. This is not something that's intangible. You can see it, you can touch it, you can taste it. And it has the ability to impact everybody along the Wasatch Front. So when is this dust most likely to occur? Well, we know that we have challenges for the air quality in the winter time, but that's not a time when the dust is prevalent because it's too wet out there. We know we have summertime air quality challenges with ozone and, and wildfire smoke. Um, that's also a time period of low dust. We generally have really good air quality in the spring and the fall, but that's when the dust is most likely to occur. And what, if this continues, what will happen is we'll move from seasonal air quality challenges uh, in northern Utah to year-round air quality challenges. So where does that dust go? Well, the larger particles can stay in the atmosphere for a few hours. The smaller ones can stay in the atmosphere for two weeks. Uh, but the larger particles, a lot of that is deposited on our snowpack. And Dr. McKinsey Skiles at the University of Utah studies the effect of dust on snow. And here you can see dust layers in the snowpack. It darkens the snow and it accelerates the snow melt. And what she discovered is that that darkening of the snow can accelerate the snow melt by several weeks which makes it more difficult to uh, capture that water um, and has important implications for the hydrology of the region, which other experts will talk more about. The particles in the atmosphere from the dust also have the potential to impact human health. PM10 and PM2.5 are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. PM10 particles, about half of those will get in your lungs. The PM2.5 particles, most of those will end up in your lungs. And uh, science has shown that exposure to the high concentrations of these can lead to a variety of health outcomes, including decreased lung function, asthma, chronic bronchitis, increased uh, uh, irregular heartbeat, heart attacks, strokes, and premature death. The recreation loss is profound. 
The Great Salt Lake Yacht Club, established in 1877. Uh, Antelope Island Marina closed in 2014. That's what it looks like today. Clearly, no boating allowed. Uh, $1.3 million was spent by the state on dredging Great Salt Lake Marina in 2017, trying to keep it open, but yet the marina closed in 2022. And most of the brine shrimp harbors were also closed in 2022. The extraction industries need canals in order to bring water to their facilities, and dredging and extending those canals has cost millions of dollars. U.S. Magnesium recently uh, put in a permit to extend their canals, and that was recently denied. And the state has decided to uh, divide the lake in two by raising the berm between the two lakes, uh, cutting off water to the northern arm in a last-ditch effort to try and save the southern part of the lake. Uh, but doing so threatens the future of Compass Minerals that relies completely upon the water in the northern arm. The risk to our state, $1.3 billion annually. The water and the lake also impact our ski area. The lake affects snow, contributes 5 to 10% of water to the Wasatch Mountains. While that may not sound like a lot, the timing of that snow is crucially important. It tends to be early season snow, uh, which helps the kick off the ski season and reduce costly uh, snowmaking uh, operations. Uh, the risk uh, generally is about $2.8 million per inch of snow to the state. And I just want to highlight my graduate student, Thorn Merrill. Uh, he's uh, skiing here uh, in this image, but he's also created a, an absolutely wonderful film uh, that looks at the impact of this shrinking Great Salt Lake from a skier's perspective. And it's my understanding that that will be shown uh, at some point during the conference as well. Other impacts to industry, the brine shrimp industry is completely dependent upon the Great Salt Lake. Uh, they harvest the brine shrimp cysts uh, and they use those for fish and shrimp hatcheries around the world. Great Salt Lake produces almost half of the world's supply. The optimum salinity for these brine shrimp is between 12 and 16 percent, and last year the Great Salt Lake reached 19 percent, which put the brine shrimp under great stress. The brine shrimp are half of the base of the food chain for Great Salt Lake. The other half is the brine flies. Now most people don't really know what brine flies are, but here's a video I'll hopefully give you a better idea. They don't bite, they just swarm, and they're an absolutely wonderful food source for millions of birds that visit Great Salt Lake. There are so many of them that the birds literally just run through the clouds of brine flies with their mouths open and they can't miss until this last year when the brine flies went missing. For the first time in my time out at the Great Salt Lake, I was out there alone without brine flies and without the birds that feed upon them. And once again, Pat Bagley encapsulates what's going on with the brine flies missing. So what's at risk? It's nothing short of the fundamental entire loss of the ecosystem. And I put together this little video montage to show you where we're at today and where we could be in as little as five years. Quite the sobering thought at what could be lost. So let's get back to my area of expertise, and that has to do with dust. So here's an example of a dust storm that is being created on the Great Salt Lake due to thunderstorm outflow. That's one way that we get dust off the lake, but yet we also have cold fronts that can bring that dust into our valley. And here you can see that wall of dust as it approaches the city. So as a scientist, I try and answer important questions. And some of the important questions that I've spent the last few years working on is trying to identify where the dust hotspots are in the Great Salt Lake. Are there potentially harmful heavy metals out there? And how do fluctuations in the lake level affect dust production? And most of the research that I'm reporting on now is completed between 2016 and 2018. So what did I do? Well, I divided the lake bed up into grids and uh, actually went out there with my bicycle and collected soil samples. Uh, I brought that soil back to the lab and dried it and sieved it and resuspended it in a chamber so that I could pull out the particles that actually end up in your lungs. And then we did chemical analysis on those to determine what that dust was made out of. I did it all by bicycle. And you might think, why would you do that? Well, if you look on the right, you can see some ATV tracks. 
And in the middle of those, you can see the tracks from the bicycle. Uh, much less damage to the playa. And uh, it's low impact, low cost. And theoretically, you won't get stuck. But you know, everybody has a bad day now and then. <coughs> Poor life choice, I think, is the way it goes. So what did I do? I did something absolutely crazy. I visited all 800 square miles of the Great Salt Lake over a two year period. I'm literally the only person on the planet who can say that they visited all of the exposed lake bed. Um, it took me 26 months. I went over 145 trips. I collected more than 5,000 soil samples. And I figured you do it once, you do it right, and then you never, never do it again. <laughs> why not use an ATV? Uh, well, here's why. Um, in the Utah test and training range, they wouldn't let me ride my bicycle because they were worried about unexploded ordnance. I like my legs. So I went with the uh, military folks, and they insisted we go by ATV. Not a good idea. It was great sampling for the first hour and a half, and then we got stuck. We spent eight hours digging, we eventually got three ATVs stuck, and we eventually got them out. But the damage we did to the playa was insane. Give you a flavor for what it's actually like. You shouldn't be able to ride a bicycle across Utah's Great Salt Lake and not get wet. But that's unfortunately what University of Utah scientist Kevin Perry can do as he studies the lake's dried out bottom, the water having dropped to its lowest level in recorded history in July, exposing 800 square miles of lake bed, an area larger than the Hawaiian island of Maui. And this exposed lake bed, when the wind is strong and the lake bed is dry, uh, it lifts dust off this lake bed and pushes it into the surrounding communities. And that is a big problem. The dust clouds are laced with calcium, sulfur, and arsenic, a naturally occurring element linked to cancer and birth defects. So what did we find? Well, one of the things that we found is that not all parts of the lake are equally able to be dust sources. If you've ever been to the beach, you grab a handful of sand, you throw it up in the air, what happens? It comes right back down. What you need is you need small particles, silt and clay, in order to be dust sources. And that silt and clay is delivered primarily through the rivers, the Bear, the Weber, and the Jordan River. And you can see here the red areas are the areas that have the highest proportions of silt and clay. And these are the areas that uh, are most likely to have the ability to be dust uh, sources. And that's primarily in Farmington Bay, in Bear River Bay, and the extreme northwestern part of the lake. So when I was out there doing my uh, research, um, I was looking at how much vegetation coverage was on the lake bed and what the surface crust actually looked like. Surface crust is a very effective way to minimize the emission of dust from the surface. And it doesn't take much, even a shallow crust that's only a few millimeters thick is enough to prevent the area from blowing away. So where is the Great Salt Lake vegetation? Whoops. Uh, Great Salt Lake vegetation, um, if you look at the northern part of the lake, it's just too salty for most vegetation, so there's not much up there. On the southern part of the lake, the vegetation is most effectively growing at the areas where there's those small particles, the silt and clay. Um, and so we have vegetation that is encroaching on the lake in the Bear River Bay and the Farmington Bay, and this is beyond the Phragmites. I never went to the Phragmites. It's impossible to travel through there. Um, a lot of this is pickleweed, but there are bushes and other uh, types of things that are going on out there. So about 15% of the lake bed is protected by this vegetation. And 67% of the lake bed is protected by a, a shallow crust. Another 4% is, is protected by a, a moderate crust, and about 1.5% of the lake is a thick crust. So you put all that together, and basically about three quarters of the lake is protected currently by a crust. Um, and that leaves us with about 26% of the lake as a potential hotspot. But just because you have no crust or an eroding crust doesn't mean that it's a hotspot. You still have to have small particles. And when you have a superposition of uh, basically no vegetation, uh, small particles, and no crust or erodible shallow crust, that's where you get your dust hotspots. And my best estimation is that only about 9% of Great Salt Lake lake bed is currently acting as a dust source as of 2018 when I finished my survey. So what does a dust hotspot look like? You know it when you see it, right? Well, here's an example. Uh, we had a crust that was out there, and that crust started to break down, and then it exposed the area underneath, and the wind scoured it. And now you have this depression out on the lake bed where uh, the wind has uh, removed the, the silt and clay and uh, brought it to the atmosphere. 
That's how incredibly thin the crust was in this region. It's just barely enough there. And as it started to break down, it turned it into an area with significant wind erosion. And over time, these dust hotspots grow in size. And sometimes they merge into a dust hotspot area. Luckily, we don't have many of these yet. But the longer the lake bed is exposed, the larger uh, these uh, dust hotspots will grow. And they will start to merge. And that 9% will inch up uh, from up to about 24%, theoretically. So where are these dust hotspots located? Well. Primarily in Farmington Bay and Bear River Bay, with uh, other areas in the extreme northwest and then over near the uh, Superfund site uh, over on the west side of the lake as well. So you say, OK, well, where does this dust blow? Well, it really depends upon the prevailing winds. Before the cold fronts come, we have strong winds from the south, which will push this dust north. And then after the cold fronts, the winds will ship around to the west, northwest, or north, uh, pushing that dust into the surrounding communities. And basically, what happens is everybody uh, along the Wasatch Front is downwind from the lake at some point. So is there anything in the lake bed dust that we might need to be worried about? Well, generally speaking, soil is composed of silicon, aluminum, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and titanium. Those are the normal soil elements. And the, the soil in Great Salt Lake has a lot of those elements in it, but it's enriched in the evaporite minerals, the salts, you know, calcium, magnesium, uh, sulfur, strontium, chlorine, lithium, and boron. Um, so you, it's not like it's Bonneville salt flats, where you go out there and it's just a white expanse everywhere. It's basically sandy soil with a lot of salt crystals in it. And in order to determine whether or not it's harmful, uh, basically looking at the Environmental Protection Agency for guidance. And they establish regional screening levels uh, to try and limit uh, the risk uh, for cancers to less than one in a million. And the regional screening level is basically the dose uh, times the toxicity. Um, and what they try and do is uh, figure out what the toxicity of the elements are, and then figure out what's the maximum dose that you could achieve to uh, minimize your cancer risk. And if the concentrations are less than the regional screening levels, then it's considered safe. If it's greater than the regional screening levels, then it's potentially unsafe. And you have to then go back and do direct measurements to find out what people are actually being exposed to. So what I found was this is the arsenic concentrations. The green and the red lines are the regional screening levels for residential and industrial exposure. And every single measurement that I took of arsenic was more than a factor of 10 greater than recommended by the EPA for long-term exposure. That got my attention. And here's a, a spatial distribution of arsenic across the entire Great Salt Lake. And arsenic is a carcinogen. Uh, it can lead to lung cancer, skin cancer, bladder cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And it's ubiquitous on the soil of the Great Salt Lake. So is this a real problem, like the uh, New York Times article scared the heck out of everybody? Or is it something that we need to learn more about? Well, the current health risks due to exposure for arsenic are actually uncertain. We have to know the dose, and we don't currently know the concentration of the frequency that people are exposed. And worse yet, we don't know what fraction of that arsenic is actually bioavailable for people. So this is an active area of ongoing research uh, that we need to continue. Um, but people are always asking me, well, is the arsenic from the mines, or is it you know, industry, or is it naturally occurring? Well, if you have a point source of pollution, then uh, it'll likely be concentrated in a certain area. And there are elements that have high concentrations in certain areas on the lake bed. And these include copper, uh, sulfur, uh, silver, phosphorus, chlorine, molybdenum, zirconium, and lead all have clear industrial signatures on the lake bed. But arsenic, on the other hand, is one of the more uniformly distributed elements across the entire lake bed. And that doesn't mean that there's not contribution from industry, but it means that its concentrations are dominated by natural deposition over a long period of time. But arsenic wasn't the only heavy metal that exceeded the regional screening levels, but it's the one that was more than an order of magnitude greater. Um, other ones included lanthanum, lithium, zirconium, cobalt, manganese, and copper. So there are threats out there that we need to have a much better understanding of. And to summarize the potential health impacts, I'm much more concerned about the dust plumes that are visible that are coming off the lake that raise the PM10 and the PM2.5 concentrations to unhealthy levels at times. But there is a potential for chronic health risks due to exposure due to some of these heavy metals that we need to understand better. 
And ultimately, everyone, all residents in northern Utah are likely to be exposed by dust at some point. Once again, Bagley does it. Unfortunately, I've had lots of people call me up after that New York Times article saying, should I move out of Utah? The answer is no. It's a wonderful place to live. And we can protect ourselves. And we have a collective will that will allow us to hopefully fix this problem. So lastly, how do fluctuating lake levels affect dust production? Well, it turns out that the US Geological Survey and the uh, Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands uh, flew an airplane over the Great Salt Lake back in 2016 and used a laser beam pointed down at the lake bed in order to determine the elevation of every spot on the lake bed, uh, every meter. And I combined that with the location of all of those dust hotspots that you've seen. And we now know the elevation of every single dust hotspot. So you can basically create a model that will tell you uh, what the lake level needs to be to cover up those dust hotspots. And for Farmington Bay, it was quite simplistic. Um, for every increase, so what we have here on the x-axis is the lake elevation. On the y-axis, we have the fraction of the dust hotspots that are covered up by water at that elevation. So if you look at um, the long-term elevation of the lake for the last 150 years at 4199, uh, that would actually, if the lake were back up at 4199, it would cover up 60% of the dust hotspots that uh, I found in my survey in Farmington Bay. Um, <clears throat> and so, it's a very linear relationship, and for Farmington Bay, it was a 13.8% decrease in the number of dust hotspots for every foot gain that you get in the lake. But you'll notice that when I did my survey, the lake was about 4,195. In the last five years, the lake has fallen an additional four feet. And I haven't fully surveyed the lake bed, but this linear trend uh, allows me to extrapolate. I usually don't like to extrapolate, but I haven't finished the research yet. And the extrapolation is that in the last four to five years, the number of dust hotspots has increased by 40%, um, which now changes the equation quite a bit. If you want to mitigate 50% of the dust hotspots, you have to get to 4,198. If you want to get to 80% mitigation, you have to get all the way up to 4,202. And once again, Bagley says it great. We have a wonderful snowpack this year. Are we solved? Is the problem solved? No, it's not. We're miles and miles away from where we need to be for dust suppression. And those tipping points, the dust was the first ecological problem to occur, and it'll be the last to be solved by putting water back in the lake. And I want to acknowledge the Great Salt Lake Strike Team that did much of the research that was presented here in the first part of the talk. Uh, funding sources, the Department of Natural Resources, the Utah Division of Facilities Construction and Management, the National Science Foundation, and support from the Woke Center for Climate Science and Policy as well. Thank you very much. I'll defer to you. Why don't you take a couple questions from the audience? So okay. We don't have a slide out here. So. Okay. So I'm available for a couple of questions. I'm told I have a couple of minutes. Yes. Thanks for all your hard work. And into the heavy metal concentrations and other potential dust sources such as severe lake bed, the West Desert, or the entire Great Basin Desert? Yeah, so and how do you how do you just how do you tell the uh, you know the source of dust reaching the Salt Lake Valley from those potential sources? Yeah, so two questions. Uh, first is are there uh, heavy metals in other lake beds in the in the Intermountain West? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, Owens Lake uh, had high concentrations of arsenic, uh, as do uh, many of the other lake beds that I visited uh, in, uh, in the region. And then, uh, you know, how do we determine the, the source of the dust? Well, what we're working on is trying to establish chemical fingerprints uh, that establish one type of uh, playa from another. Um, so Greg Carling at Brigham Young University has been working very hard on that uh, and uh, looking at not only just the elemental ratios, but looking at the strontium isotopes uh, uh, is a way to distinguish. Um, and then we're also uh, starting to, as part of this dust squared research project that I'm a member of, uh, looking at whether or not biological components of the dust can be used to fingerprint as well. So what I'd like to say is that the Great Salt Lake is not the 
biggest dust source in Utah. There are other bigger dust sources. This is the one that just happens to be on our doorstep and is, as a result, the one that we're most concerned about from a human health perspective. Yes? Um, are you aware of, um, you know, kind of mitigation solutions? So, so the question is, is uh, you know, am I aware of any mitigation solutions? So Owens Dry Lake Bed uh, in Los Angeles, uh, they spent two and a half billion dollars trying to mitigate the dust without putting water back in the lake. And what they determined is that after two and a half billion dollars, the most effective way to reduce the dust is to put water back in the lake. Great Salt Lake is 12 to 15 times bigger than Owens Dry Lake, and mitigation would be at least an order of magnitude larger for that. And so I think the prudent thing from a fiscal perspective is that saving the Great Salt Lake itself will be the most cost-effective way to do dust mitigation. Do we know at what level of the lake the ideal salinity would return, and will the brine flies come back, or is there a time in which if we don't get the lake up, they won't come back? So that's a little out of my expertise, and so I'm going to defer to some of the later spe uh, speakers. Um, it's my understanding that there is some resilience in the system, uh, but uh, it's not a threshold that we want to cross and flirt with to come back from, uh, because in the interim, when the brine flies are gone, the birds that rely upon those will die, uh, and uh, recovery of those populations uh, may be even more problematic. Did your bicycle survive? <laughs> the, did my bicycle survive? The first bicycle I had lasted 750 miles until it rusted through. Uh, it was metal. I called it the tank. Uh, after that, I invested in a carbon fiber bicycle, and it has done quite well, sort of thing. Uh, Kevin, you've got a question on uh, Slido. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, from someone who lives in uh, Cache Valley in the Bear River watershed asking if the dust will travel up, uh, up there and how far does the dust travel? Yeah, so I mentioned that the larger, dust puddles, the larger dust particles will stay in the atmosphere for a few hours. So if the wind is blowing at 20 or 30 miles an hour, that kind of gives you a range of 100 to 150 miles for those larger particles. Those smaller particles will stay in the atmosphere until it rains, uh, which is an average of two weeks. And so the dust that's coming off the Great Salt Lake in two weeks can be transported all the way to Europe, all the way to China. And we've seen that the intercontinental transport of dust is something that we see every year. In the summertime, we have African dust, which travels across the uh, Atlantic and into the eastern United States. Here in the western US, we see Asian dust that's being transported across the Pacific. Um, the dust from our little lake bed is, uh, pales in comparison to those dust sources, but uh, theoretically, that dust will stay in the atmosphere for a long time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ling Shi Chen Yang, Associate Professor here at the College of Law, and it is my um, delight to introduce Professor uh, Robert Gillies, uh, Professor and Director of Plants, Soils, and Climate at the Utah Climate Center at Utah State uh, University. And his presentation is titled, Water, Water Everywhere, But Not a Drop to Drink. Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry about that, but the person who's supposed to be shepherding us, she was shepherding herself somewhere else. Uh, so um, I'm the director of the Utah Climate Center, also the state climatologist for the state of Utah. And this is our website here, and the Utah Climate Center is actually a state-funded center whose mission is to facilitate access to climate data and information and to use expertise in atmospheric science to interpret climate information in an accurate and innovative fashion. So, you might have been bemused by the title of my talk, which was Water, Water Everywhere, and All the Boards Did Shrink. So this is uh, uh, the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which was a poem that we all had to learn in Scotland uh, in our English classes, and I don't know if that's the case here in the US, but the theme of the poem 
is that a sailor shoots an albatross uh, in the Pacific, and as a result, the sailors or his uh, colleagues or companions are appalled by this because it brings them terrible luck. And what happened, of course, is they become becams. The scientific aspect of this is that the ship actually sailed into the doldrums, which is where the northeast trades meet the southeast trades and essentially cancel each other out. So water, water everywhere, and all the boars did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink, which I thought was an ideal metaphor for the fact of the shrinkage of the lake. And we can factor in the albatross there with a, a sort of bird analogy as well. So I'm sure you'll see figures like this ad infinitum throughout all the presentations today and tomorrow. Uh, is quite marked. And of course, the source and percentage of water use that goes to the, the shrinking is associated with these factors here. So agriculture, 60 to 70% uses of the water. Uh, mineral extraction, about 13. Municipal, industrial, about 11. Impounded wetlands, about 10. And finally, reservoir evaporation is about 3%. And this shrinkage can be presented in another way, which you've actually seen already this morning, uh, where you can see that around in the, oops, go back, you have to be careful here. You can, uh, <laughs> I won't touch the cursor anymore. <laughs> you can see that around 83, when we had that huge flood, you know, which, when uh, the snow melted and we had uh, State Street flooding and coffins coming down out of the avenues and things like that. But you can see the general shrinkage uh, of the, the lake level. And then the orange there, I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a minute. So my theme for you today is to think of climate change acting as a magnifier with respect to those other uh, diversions of water. So climate change is sort of sitting on top, so to speak, of the already diversions that exist. So this is interesting. I hope you recognize it. So this is the cooling water in the Western Pacific, which you all probably know as La Nina, okay? So that blue tongue there. And of course, we're in a triple La Nina which is quite unusual. And then, of course, the opposite to that would be, uh, if you look at the scale down there uh, of the temperature scale and notice the red, that would be the El Nino. So this is the ENSO signal, which a lot of climate scientists use for forecasting. And the forecast this year was La Nina, rising global temperatures, led forecasters to predict a warm, dry winter for Utah, and that was reported, as you can see there, in the daily news in St. George. And we know that that did not happen. So just relying on one oscillation or one climate signal uh, to make forecasts is fraught with folly in many ways. And so I've got a little simulation coming on next uh, which my colleague, Dr. Rob Davies, produced. He's a professor of physics, and it'll sort of explain this a little bit more. So this is a putting green um, on a golf course, and the putting hole is the little red dot there. Now, of course, we want to keep our putting greens nice and green, so what do we do? We use sprinklers. And we have them uh, located at different points given uh, well, perhaps th the way the soils are, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what it would look like. So we have one sprinkler there, then another one, and another one come. And you'll notice they have different rotation rates. They have different fetches. In other words, how far they, they, they spread the sprinkler, OK? And as a result, they're being constructive or destructive in terms of watering the hole. 
Now, if we extend that out uh, into the climate system, we have various oscillations, not just La Nina, El Nino, the ENSO, but we have many others which are all coming together in different fashions to affect the climate and the precipitation in Utah. So as you see, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't, there's an overlap there, etc. So this is what really we should be thinking about in terms of not just going with one particular uh, oscillation in the climate system, but perhaps considering more. So the work that we've done in the Climate Center is actually perhaps more interesting. So what you see here is the sea surface temperature in the Western Pacific, where the yellow occurs, uh, warm water, where the blue occurs, cold water, okay? And if we go, you'll see that there are peaks and troughs, so there's a nice oscillation here. And if you go from one peak to the next peak, it's about 10 years, maybe 12, okay? So this is what's happening in the Western Pacific in a region that's called the Nino 4 region. And if we then go from a peak halfway down towards the trough, which is about three years, because remember this is a 12-year uh, cycle, what we found was that if you go halfway through there, in northern Utah, the precipitation peaked. And then if you go from the peak of the precipitation down three years, we have a peak in the Great Salt Lake's elevation. So what we have here is a coherency between a particular oscillation that we call the, the quasi-decadal oscillation in the Western Pacific, uh, the precipitation, and the Great Salt Lake. And when you have that sort of connection, you can actually do some predictions with it. Now, what I want to point out here is that when you think about ENSO, which is La Nina, El Nino, we're talking about the extremes. This type of uh, connection, as you can see, is the transition between the extremes, right? And given that sort of knowledge and the fact that you have this coherency, we are able to predict the Great Salt Lake elevation. And that's what you see here in the orange. So we're able to predict not just the turnarounds, but also the extent. And so when uh, this was run, you just I think it was run in September. It was updated. This is on our website. And when I saw this, I was not one of the ones who was quoted in the paper in St. George saying it was going to be a warm dry winter. I was exactly the opposite. Okay, but I don't believe I was quoted. <laughs> is it? I'll pull it toward, that's better, isn't it? Okay, so now I would like to move on to a paper that I published with my colleagues in the Climate Center in 2012, and it was the observation on synoptic analyses of the winter precipitation regime change over Utah, and it was published in the Journal of Climate. In that paper, uh, the conclusions were that the winter max and min temperatures were increasing over time in northern Utah. The winter precipitation was increasing in northern Utah. The winter regime was changing from snow to rain. There were fewer storms, bringing in that precipitation, which implied that the storms were more intense. So this year, I've asked my colleagues to redo this paper uh, because it's been 10 years, okay? And they've just done that. We're, we just sent it out for publication. And what they found was, this is still true. This is not, this is still true. And this is still true. Now, before I ask my colleague John to 
mention some of the results of these uh, uh, of this research. I just want to go to this slide and show you what's called. This is the snow water equivalent divided by the runoff. The snow water equivalent is when we take the snow and we melt it and measure how much water was in that particular snow. What this is, is actually an index of how important snow is to our water regime, okay? And you'll see that it pretty much goes up into the orange and reds. So snow is extremely important in the Intermountain West and of course to Utah. Now, Going from this forward, hopefully this. Ten years ago, we found that over the last half century, Utah's wintertime precipitation was changing pretty dramatically. Intuitively so, with the warming climate, our snowpack season is being reduced on both ends. So it's arriving later in the fall and ending earlier in the spring. Counterintuitively though, we found we were actually seeing more water being delivered through the wintertime months. So we revisited this study and we found that we now are seeing increasingly dangerous trends towards less precipitation overall. So the trends that we were seeing of better precipitation in the wintertime months has reversed. We're now seeing less precipitation and we're seeing greater amounts of it arriving in the form of rainfall. Which when you have a snowpack and it's raining on top of that can really supercharge the problem of snowpack collapse. Well, when we look forward in time, the biggest key takeaway that we're finding right now is this expectation for these trends to continue to get worse. We see the same thing with snow, like March and November are seeing the greatest reduction in snow. The impacts and effects that we're seeing to our snowpack, to our annual water budget, have just really begun. Uh, the changes in the impacts in northern Utah are the most apparent and we expect to see these trends continue with less and less available snowpack in the times that we've grown to be accustomed to the available water. And so this very much is a red flag looking forward into our water supply. And so here is some of that data. So this is the Utah snow accumulation season length. And the takeaway from this is that, well, first of all, let me point out that the blue is high terrain, which is greater than 2,200 uh, meters. Sorry, I'm not going to use feet. Um, and then, of course, the yellow is all areas. So the takeaway from this figure here is that Utah has lost about two weeks of snow season on either end of the accumulation season. Only the late season remained mostly unaffected. However, total water content during the late season has experienced significant declines due to the warming spring weather. It's arriving earlier, and of course we have rain on snow events. Then if we look further to the data that John was just uh, talking about, um, hopefully that comes up reasonably well is if we just look for now at panel A precipitation. I don't need to actually explain that. It is pretty definitive in terms of the decline. As precipitation includes rain and snow. And so, of course, panel C and D break those out where rain is declining and snow is declining. And then finally, panel E is the snow precipitation ratio with a positive value, meaning dominant snow and a negative value, meaning rain, there's more uh, rain in the precipitation regime. And then the next slide basically is the observed snowpack change here from uh, 1955 to 2014. And if you actually look at Utah, it's pretty much all in the orange uh, with a decrease, i.e. less water. And if we simulate that for you. What I'm going to do is put up the simulation here. This is observations, and we're going to go from 1950 through 2000. We're going to focus on this region here, and I'll run the simulation for you now.
So what I've shown you up until now have all been observations with the recent one uh, coming from the Utah Climate Centre. If we then look at projections, this is the projection, projected snow water equivalent. Remember, this is when you take the snow and you melt it. Um, and you can see in all the Western states, there's obviously a decline. Some states, much more of a severe decline than others. And this is measured over what we call 30-year normals. Uh, so you have 1971 to 2000, going all the way up to the end of the century, uh, 2017 to 29, and is pretty obvious. And then if we simulate that, what's happening there, So now we're going into what the models, the climate models, will simulate for the future. C'est la vie. Okay. So these are the global temperatures okay, that you're watching here. And we're going to go from 1890 up to about oh, 2012, 2015. Okay? So I want you to watch what is, has happened over this period. From there to there. So what you really can see there is that the Arctic has warmed way, way more than anywhere else in the world. And that has a significant thing. That gradient between the equator and the poles results and changes this phenomenon. So what you see there is the jet stream. And this particular configuration that is becoming more dominant as a result of that temperature gradient between the equator and the poles is referred to as a wave number five uh, configuration. And so what you can see, and hopefully I won't go to the next slide, you end up bringing very warm air up into the Arctic. And over here, you can see that there's very cold air being brought down all the way to places like Florida or states like Florida. So this is a distinctive ridge where you would have high pressure, uh, whereas over here in the trough you would have low pressure and precipitation. Then, of course, what's happening up here is it's getting rather hot. And the result of all of this is this. The fact that this is the change in min, uh, mean winter temperature from 1970 to 2023. And what is happening is that the winter is the fastest warming season for the continental US. Okay, As a result of this uh, gradient and the jet stream dynamics that are in place as a result of a warming atmosphere. So the mean for the winter is about 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit and then summer 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit. And then looking at the, our data okay, from the paper, you can see what's happening with respect to the average temperatures, that they are all generally increasing. The lighter colored bars, again, represent trends for high terrain, and the darker colored bars represents the trend for the entirety of Utah. Okay, so up here we have temperature, Average temperature increasing down here, the average dew point temperatures are decreasing, and that is indicative of a, of, um, a very dry or a drying atmosphere. Okay. Now, if we drill down a little bit more as to what's happening around the state, this next slide is associated with uh, observational data. We have about 100 years worth of data from Tooele. And uh, if we then look at the, the histogram distribution of the temperature data there, 
this is what it looks like in the 1960s. Okay. So we've got su uh, surface temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the x-axis and the number of days that that temperature was observed on the y-axis. This is the mean of the distribution. And of course, this is the maximum value in the distribution. So then, if we then go forward and look at 2000s, you see that the distribution has shifted to the right, okay, in terms of a warming atmosphere. If we drill down a little bit more here, we can look at this from the perspective of decadal. So each of these is a, a decade uh, where you've got days above, in this case, 90 degrees. If we move to 95, then moving along to 100. So we had 66 days above 100 over a 90 year period. Whereas in the recent times, we've had 94 days above 100 in Tuala. These are the days above 101, 102, 103. So we had four days above 103 over the last 90 years prior to 2000, and then we had 28 days above 103 uh, in more recent times. So that's just a, a real sort of, uh, sort of microscopic uh, look at what was happening, at least in Tuala, where we have 100 years worth of really good data. So then recent research by my colleagues at uh, Utah State is associated with this. So you're seeing what's called um, weather uh, features here, three and four, where uh, weather feature four are the ridge, ridges dominant, and weather feature three is the troughs. And I just basically put it in there that fewer troughs, not more ridges, have led to a drying trend in the Western United States. So there's fewer troughs, not more ridges. And that sort of goes in line with the, the observational material that I was presenting earlier. Okay, now I want to take a completely different segue. Um, and hopefully, well, I'm gonna have two segues if I have enough time. Uh, but it's associated with research that I've been doing with uh, some Chinese colleagues. And it's associated with black carbon in the Himalayas, well, actually northern India, which is affecting the Himalayas and actually the Tibetan Plateau. So the Tibet Tibetan Plateau is key to the water resources for many, many countries and many, many millions of people. And so what is happening here is akin to what's happening with the Great Salt Lake because it's associated with pollution So what you're seeing here are, is a brick kiln, and you can see they are producing a lot of black carbon. And the reason I introduced this is I want to talk about the albedo effect, which uh, Kevin was talking about earlier on too, but I still wanted to try and cement this in your mind. Uh, but I was using this and uh, we'll go further from here. So I'll stop this hopefully and move on to the next slide. So this is the annual per capita brick production. And you see the red there is over 200 bricks per person. So there are thousands upon thousands of those, mil, uh, of those uh, brick kilns all the way along northern India. And of course, this is what happens.
So I'm going to stop it there. It's, it's, it goes on, but that's graphic enough for you. Now, of course, that has implications for the Wasatch Front. Oops, sorry. But here's the implications in Asia. So those are the implications for the Tibetan Plateau in many ways. Um, not quite analogous to the Great Salt Lake, but nonetheless important. But there's more complexity to it, as probably there is with terms of the climate regime here in Utah. And I'm going to go forward and here. So this pink line here is the carbon emissions that are coming from India, and you see the dramatic rise. Okay. I have to go back, be careful with the cursor. And then this line here is the decrease in precipitation in the southern aspect of the Tibetan Plateau. This is the configuration that is normal for summer precipitation. But what we find out, not just the albedo effect is coming into play here, but the effect is here in this panel here is that the, got to be careful with cursors. <laughs> The, the actual circulation pattern has changed. So I'm not going to go into the details, but that's it there. And then this next slide just shows you, oops, sorry. This next slide here just shows you, this is the humidity uh, which has changed as a result. So it's negative. Okay, so now I have to interject some humor uh, into all of this and uh, Hopefully you'll bear with me on this one, but there's an important point to make here. So I'll run this uh, movie clip and it will, it's a little bit long, but I have time. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to stop it there. <laughs> I'm sure you all recognize that it's a James Bond movie, but which one? Okay, so yes, James Bond movie, but which one? Well, it was the Quantum of Solace. And if you remember the movie, it's going back a ways now. It was all associated with uh, Dominic Green, who was an environmentalist, a corrupt environmentalist, who blackmails uh, General uh, Medrano into signing a contract that will make Medrano the leader of Bolivia in exchange for the land rights, making Green's Bolivia Bolivia's sole, sole, sole water source or provider at significantly higher rates. Now, I used to always show this just as an abstract thing, but CBS reported the other day, at least in my Apple news feed, this, and that is that, oops, Wall Street is now investing in, uh, or Wall Street investment firms are now buying up rights to scare water uh, throughout the West. And that took me by surprise, I have to say. It really did. So to conclude in all of this, we've been talking about the winter precipitation rain, but there is another one that's very important, and that is the North American monsoon. It's an incredibly complex uh, weather system. It's difficult to predict on any time scale. It's a provider of valuable rainfall localized in extreme, and it is therefore able to buffer short-term drought and prevent long-term drought degradation. It's changing, it's becoming more variable, it's occurring in hotter summers, and there is an expectation for monsoons, more and more extreme uh, monsoon seasons. This is sort of the feast of famine uh, scenario. And just to show you that, this is a quick brief here. What you see, uh, I'm going to be careful with my cursor, but down here, this is the precipitation. See, but see what happens. <laughs> uh, that there's not a noticeable trend in overall monsoon precipitation, but though the, that above that is the red plot, and that's the standard deviation, and then the black line is the trend in that standard deviation. So the year-to-year -year variability of the monsoon is increasing, so we've got lower predictability in any given year. And then my final slide is what we call the alligator trend, and you can see there that the season of summer temperatures is expanding into spring and fall. So we're getting a longer warm season. And so that theoretically places, uh, places additional stress on water supplies and agriculture. And I'm almost out of time. Worked it fairly well, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gillies. If there are any questions from the audience, I think we have time for maybe one or two. One, I think. It says 938 here. <laughs> Mic's not on. Your mic is off. Uh, yeah, is any... Yeah. Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. Um, one of your graphs showing you know, temperature um should we try and go to that slide maybe can you also repeat the question I've forgotten what it is now. So let's see temperatures. So it's with respect to this, is that right? So. So the question was it looks like, like in panel B, it's not a huge effect, but it looks like um, temperatures, the average temperature at the higher elevations is more. Um, 
Um, I don't know how to answer that actually without really thinking about it. Um, I can't think of any sort of uh, physical uh, explanation for that. And it may, this is reanalysis data, so it may be associated statistically rather than physically. Um, and it doesn't look like it's that dramatic compared to the two, really. Does that make sense? Okay, I think that's all the time that we have. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gillies. Okay. Um, next, we have Professor uh, Sarah Knoll. Um, she is the Associate Professor at the College of Natural Resources Watershed Sciences uh, Department at Utah State University, and her talk is titled Great. Hi there. Welcome to everyone. It's great to be here this morning. It's fun to see a whole room of people who care about Great Salt Lake. I don't have Rob's nice Scottish brogue, so you're going to have to go back to a normal Western US accent um, and, and bear with me. OK, today I'm going to be talking about Great Salt Lake hydrology. I am, in the, I am a professor of watershed sciences at Utah State University. Um, I'm a kind of a hydrologist or, or physical geographer, really broadly. I do systems analysis, and in particular, I focus on environmental water management. So how could we improve water management to some natural places and maintain human water uses at the same time? That's kind of the, the goal of all my research. So we're going to be looking at the problems of Great Salt Lake today through a hydrologic lens and, and really thinking about the hydrology of the Great Salt Lake and what that can tell us. Okay, so as we all know, Great Salt Lake declined to a historic low last year in 2022. This graph is showing through time, starting just after 1900, showing Great Salt Lake on the average annual lake level every year. So we could see that in the, you know, in the late 1980s, we had those really high lake levels. That's when the, the pumps were working and we were pumping water into the West Desert. Then in the mid-90s, we kind of had a middle elevation that was pretty good. And then now we're at this very low place, kind of reaching its, its lowest point last fall. Since then, we've had a pretty nice um, wet season, and I'll talk more about that. But you can see that from the, the late 1980s until now, we've had this really downward, steady downward trend. You know, you can't really say, oh, that's just variability. Like, we are just in a declining trend. And we all know that, that lake elevation matters to all of us. First of all, it matters to the ecology of the lake. And the ecology of the lake, you know, we have birds that migrate throughout the, the northern and southern hemisphere. So the ecology of the lake is really has kind of a global importance. So these figures here, these, these arrows, those are adapted from forestry, fire, and state lands, traffic light signal, where green are showing good elevations or suitable elevations, and the red areas are starting to show where we get into problems. So what we should take from this is there's no single elevation um, that's going to meet all the objectives or be optimal for every single objective. However, there are ranges that that we should be at. So kind of, you know, I think around 4,200, give or take a little bit, 4,200 feet. Um, that seems to be the best for most elevations. So moving from left to right on this, we have, you know, the first one is, is the salinity, including things like microbialites, the brine shrimp, the brine flies. We want more of, you know, around 4,200 in there. Moving into um, the bay habitats and bacteria on the second column. The north, the north arm bacterial diversity in the, in the middle column there, um, moving into wetlands, and then ending with dust. Dust, as Kevin mentioned, you know, the higher the lake elevation is the, better f this is the best for dust. But even aside from the ecology, Great Salt Lake matters to all of us. It matters to our state economy, where the lake directly generates over $1.5 billion in 2023 dollars matters for air quality, and because of that, it affects our human health. And, and Kevin did a really nice job of, of discussing that all for us this morning. So we know we care about Great Salt Lake. So what I'm going to talk about today is what is the hydrology of the Great Salt Lake? Let's go over it so we all understand it. Why is Great Salt Lake level so low? Will a wet year save us? 
And then what are some promising strategies to preserve Great Salt Lake? Um, and my first degree, my bachelor's degree is in economics, so I still dabble in economics and I tend to tie a lot of my work um, into economics so that it's really intuitive for everybody to understand. So by the end of my presentation, you'll see me do some of that. So as a reminder, Great Salt Lake is always undergoing change, right? Great Salt Lake is the remnant of Lake Bonneville during, during the Pleistocene. We know that the lake has had many different levels. And I always like this slide or put a slide like this so that we remember that Great Salt Lake is always changing. And some of those changes are outside of our control, but some are within our control. And that's going to be the focus that I talk about today. So now we're going to get into the hydrology itself here. So of the water that gets to Great Salt Lake, stream flow is really a biggie. Stream flow contributes about two thirds of the water to Great Salt Lake. Direct precipitation, so that's precipitation falling directly on the lake, is about 31%. Groundwater is maybe 2 to 3%. And of these terms, groundwater is where we have the most uncertainty. This is, these figures here are dating back to studies done in the 70s. There are a number of, of groups undergoing research on groundwater right now. So this is an area of active research, is trying to pin down exactly the contribution of groundwater and how it might change through years. But going back to the stream flow, so stream flows two thirds of the water that gets to Great Salt Lake. And of the main rivers that all flow in through the, from the Wasatch Front, Bear River's the biggie. It contributes over half of that amount of stream flow. Weber and Jordan then make up kind of almost the rest. There's slight contributions from some drains and from the West Desert, but those tend to be pretty small and sometimes ephemeral. One thing to also notice in this figure is that all of the, the rivers from the Wasatch Front feed into the south arm of the lake. So Bear River goes into Bear River Bay, Weber and Jordan go into Farmington Bay. So all of that fresh water is coming into the south arm of the lake. When I talk about arms, that becomes important because we've constructed a, um, a causeway, a solid fill causeway that bisects the lake. So now I think of the lake as really having two distinct portions of the lake. The north arm, this, this, arm, this figure here is facing west, so the north arm is the reddish arm. Um, it can be up to 27% salinity, so it can reach saturation. The, then the south arm, the shown more in the green here, Last summer, last fall, that reached 18% salinity. And that's really a problem because that's the threshold of where some species can exist. So things like brine shrimp and brine flies, they were at their, their tolerance levels. And so that's a problem for the whole ecology of the lake and for our resilience of the lake. So now let's think about the water balance of the lake. And this is something hydrologists do to understand basically where we can make changes and where, where we can have the most impacts. Terminal lakes are really nice because they're kind of blissfully simple. I mean, when you think about big water supply systems and cities, and terminal lakes are, are really nice and simple. So this sort of, so thinking about how much water is in the lake, if we want to change the volume of the lake, we have a couple terms to keep in mind. The first is stream flow. So if I, I've, as I've already mentioned, two thirds of the water from the, to the lake comes from stream flow, that's the Q term, plus groundwater. We know that groundwater is pretty small. Then we have precipitation times the area of the lake minus evaporation times the area of the lake. And then here we have diversions. Most terminal lakes you wouldn't have diversions, but here we do. Because we can have West Desert pumping, which removes water, or because of mineral extractions that take water from the lake and it evaporates, so that water never comes back to the lake. So in this case, we have some diversions. So if we, want to, if, if we want Great Salt Lake to increase, we know that we need to increase either stream flow, groundwater, which is small, or precipitation. We don't have a whole lot of control over precipitation, but we do over stream flow because of our diversions and our human uses, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. And then if the lake is continuing to decline, like it has been in the last, say, 25 years, that means that the evaporation term has been outweighing the other terms. It's been larger than those other terms. So the lake has declined. So one of the things, one of the strategies that we've done recently and we're doing more of is changing the area of the lake. So we have in the causeway of, that bisects the lake, there's a breach shown on the left figure here. So the breach is an opening where some water can pass through so that, so that some of the salinity and some of the water can pass between the north and the south arm. The hydrodynamics of it are pretty complex, 
but we're increasing the berm. So we're raising the berm in the right figure. You can see where there's an, a berm underneath the surface of the water and we can raise that or lower that. That's one of the ways that we can adaptively manage the lake. It was the berm was constructed to have this sort of adaptive capacity and we're using it right now. So we're increasing the berm basically to separate the north arm off. So separate it off and keep all those salts on the north arm where then all, this, all the fresh water is gonna come into the south arm. So by doing that, we're changing the area in this water balance equation. And here I've also put the salt concentration. So the salt concentration is the salt load coming in each year. So we think of streams as being fresh water and they are, but they have trace amounts of salts and minerals. Um, and there's no way for those to leave except, well, through the through mineral extraction, but naturally there's no way for them to leave. Only, only the fresh water evaporates. So the salt load minus the volume. So right now we're changing this lake. And this is kind of what I think of as, as an RLC solution. This is what the RLC did. They changed the area of the lake in order to manage it. All right, so now I'm kind of edging it on Rob's turf a little bit, and I'm showing that the mean precipitation anomaly, this is for the whole state of Utah, so this is averaged over the whole state. This is from 1900 to present. And then the black line is a 10-year is a mean going through here. So when I look at this, I'd say, you know, I don't see huge changes so far to precipitation. That doesn't mean they're not going to happen in the future because of because of climate variability. But so far, I haven't seen big, huge changes. We'll talk about the next, the, the kind of the most recent 20 years. We're going to come back to those in a little bit later in the talk. And then this is mean temperature anomaly for, um, for temperature, for air temperature. And again, I should have explained these figures a little bit, a bit, little bit better. So everything in red is warmer than normal in this case, and everything um, in the blue is a little bit cooler than normal. So you can see that we're having this, this shift. We're, we're getting warmer temperatures here. All in all, that leads to some drying. Rob did a really nice job of discussing that. We know there's some periodicity to the lake where the, the conditions of the lake tend to lag what we see in the climate by, by maybe you know eight to 12 years in that ballpark somewhere. All right, so now let's look at unregulated flow. So unregulated flow is also sometimes called natural flow. This is modeled. So natural flow would be, is modeled. So we use models to say, um, if there were no diversions and no human water uses and no land use changes, what would be the stream flow? So we make a water balance and we can, we can estimate what natural flow would be. This is really useful because it separates out diversions in human and consumptive human water uses. So earlier today, um, Kevin showed some figures that include diversions. And so we saw stream flows that had this, this strong declining trend. But if we look at just natural flows, what the flows would be, be like without any people on the landscape, we can see that these are pretty consistent. So what stands out to me is I see a lot of year-to-year -year variability. I see wet years, I see dry years, so I see a lot of ups and downs, but I don't see a trend. I don't see a declining trend or even an increasing trend. I see pretty uniform average flows. So even though we know that the, the climate has warmed some, we're not seeing big changes in our, in our unregulated flows. By the way, and importantly, this data goes back to 1989. So this is the last, say, 30 years, close to 30 years, 25 years or so of data. All right, now let's look at consumptive water uses here. So consumptive water uses, so this is the water that we consume, very much like the term describes. So it is evaporated, transpirated, we might drink glasses of water, use it for cooking. It's water that's consumed and will never return to the lake. And this is really different to separate this from diversions because we can divert a lot of water, but some of that might actually return to the lake, right? Some might flow through interflow or groundwater or runoff and come back to streams or come back to the lake. This is water that's consumed. It will never come back to the lake. So here we can break this up by uses. So in the black line, I have total consumptive uses. Then we see agriculture, municipal and industrial in red, managed wetlands in orange, mineral extraction, and reservoir evaporation. Another thing that sticks out to me is these are all pretty consistent, right? So we go, okay, well, we have pretty consistent stream flows so far. We have pretty consistent human consumption. The one thing to note is that human consumption is really high. 
Compared to our stream flows, we're using anywhere from 50 to 50% 50 to maybe 66% or so of that of our stream flows we're, we're consumptively using. So we're using a lot of this water. And in doing so, we've taken a, a good deal of the resilience away from the lake, that resilient capacity. But there's a little bit more to the story. If we go back farther, we know that we developed our water. We started giving out, you know, we started managing water rights. Um, developed our legal code, our water code here in the mid 1800s. And so that's when we started not only diverting water, but consuming water. And so this top figure is showing water uses through time, consumptive water uses through time. Agriculture really jumps out, but there are other ones also, right? There's urban and municipal, there's mineral ponds, um, there's managed wetlands. And so the bottom line that I like to think of is we're all using this water. All of Utahns were all using this water. And then the bottom figure is nice. It shows the red line is our measured lake level. You see a little bit of you know, variability year to year and even seasonally. And the green line is modeled data showing what we think lake level would be if we had no con human um, consumption. And, or excuse me, no consumptive uses. So agriculture, cities, all of those changes we've made, we would expect to see a lot of variability in the lake, but not this downward trend. So this tells us a lot that human consumption or consumptive water uses are really a, a major knob that we can turn. It's a management knob. We also know that our infrastructure dates back over 100 years. So this figure on the left is showing reservoir capacity. This is just in the Bear, Weber, Weber and Jordan basins. So beginning about the 1900s and continuing into, into the beginning of, of you know, maybe the 1950s, 1960s, we started building a lot of reservoirs. That changes water flows a lot. That changes management of, of, of the water reaching the lake. And of course, we build reservoirs because they help us. We want to have lots of water in the summer, which is our dry season, and have those nice steady flows for irrigations for cities and take off the floods. Rob, Rob mentioned a lot of the flooding, try to take off those flood peaks and store water for the summer. So it changes our flows considerably. But again, this is there's some promise in this. There's some hard decisions, but there's some promise also in that um, this is consumptive water use is our policy level. This is something that we can change. When we think about climate change, there are things we can change, but it's probably hard to do on the scale of Utah. But when we think about consumptive water uses, that is something that we can change on the scale of Utah. All right, now, you know, a bunch of you in the audience might be thinking, okay, yeah, but this is a wet year. So is this year going to save us, or do we still need to be concerned? Because this is such a gangbusters year. This is the year we've all been waiting for. So here I've, I've taken plots of snow water equivalent. Um, Rob did a really nice job of explaining those. So we can see percentiles. So the blue area is showing our wettest years. The red is showing our driest years. The median line is in green there, and the median kind of high peak area, peak flows, or peaks snow water equivalent is in green. This is through one year, it's through one water year. And then in black, we have this year. So you can see we're doing great, right? We're starting to get up into that blue area. By the way, this is just for the Bear, Bear River Basin. It's not for the whole state. So we're looking good so far. It's only the middle of March, but we're looking great. So let's compare this now to a couple of other really wet years. So here's 2017, another wet year. We're, we're tracking a little bit later, maybe. 2011, we're pretty right on track to where 2011 was. 2011 was noticeable in that snow water equivalent peaked pretty late, peaked about May 1st. That's a little bit late than is more typical. 1997, that's where we were looking. We had more earlier snowpack in 1997. But so we can look at these previous years, previous wet years to say, what happened to Great Salt Lake in these years? And that gives us a really nice way to understand what might happen this year without having to do a whole lot of modeling, just using the data that we have. So this is a figure showing through time the annual elevation change of Great Salt Lake. So you can see zero, that's showing no change in lake elevation from year to year. And you can see some, some years when the lake increased its elevation and some years that the lake dropped. Lots of years, in fact, that the lake dropped. So what I want to point out to you is, I don't know if this pointer, 
After Rob, I don't want, there we go, it works. So here we have 2011. I'll try to keep talking to the microphone. We have 2011, so this was a wet year. Notice that the lake increased by about two feet in elevation. So that what this tells me is we can't bank on a single wet year to get us there. We need, we're gonna need to do more than just wait for a single wet years. 2005, right in here, about half a foot elevation. So this is annual average. So this is once we go through the summer when evaporation tends to increase. Overall, we might, you know, maybe we'll do have two feet of elevation. Maybe it'll be a little bit more. Remember that we have bermed, have, have risen, have we have raised the berm in the causeway. So this is going to change the area. So this year is a little bit more of an unknown, and we're continuing to do that. Um, but we can't. We probably can't just bank on a single wet year to save the lake. One more caveat is that one foot of water or one foot of elevation gain can require different volumes of water because the lake is a basin. It's kind of this shallow bowl shaped. So a foot elevation at a very low lake level will require a less water than a foot increase at a higher elevation. Right, so just one reminder, we always talk about a foot elevation, but they can require different amounts of water depending on where we're at. Just remember that. And then also we have some competition for this wet year water. So these figures are showing on the, on the right here, I have the teacup diagram for the Bureau Reservoirs. And so this is showing how full they are. This is taken, I think, Monday I took this plot. I don't know what's up with Willard Bay. There's curly water in Willard Bay. Maybe that data wasn't working from the Bureau. But so we have, we want to end, we want to go into irrigation season and into the summer with full reservoirs, right? So that's our goal is, as water managers are going to be trying to not have flooding. This is a tricky period as we get into spring and warming and lots of snowpack. We want to not have flooding, but end the, the snowy season with full reservoirs. And then this plot on the left is really telling. So this is um, a kind of a runoff year. So it starts in April and it shows this, the reservoir storage for the whole state except for Flaming Gorge and Lake Powell. Those really big ones that behave a little bit different. So you can see the mean um, capacity, the mean reservoir capacity where we kind of normally are much higher than where we have been in the last two years. And then when we can see the previous year in blue here, we started off in good shape and then we had a not very great, a warm summer, a not very great winter. And we ended the year not, you know, out in, out in this range, not nearly as high reservoir storage as we wanted to be. So this year we started really low, this green line right over there started really low. And now we have a pretty steep curve. So we're raising that, we're trying to fill our, our reservoirs. But because of that, we're not, all of this water that, that is up in the snowpack is not gonna reach the lake. A lot of it we're gonna use for our other water objectives. One more reminder, so the US Drought Monitor still has large proportions of, of Utah in drought. Northern Utah, where we are, is in a severe drought, and that's because of things like reservoir storage and overall dry conditions, dry soils, things like that, that have taken a lot, a good deal of water just to kind of get back to normal, get back out of these drought conditions. All right, so let's come back to this Pre precipitation anomaly figure that I've shown. And let's highlight in, focus on these last 20 years where the whole West, the American West, has been in a prolonged and ongoing drought. So a couple things really jump out at me from them. First, we've had longer droughts, right? So the, the drought, we've had pretty um, unrelenting 20 years or so of drought, but they've been punctuated by these very wet years, like 2011, 2017, now 2013. We're tending to not get many years of many wet years in a row, and that's hard to manage for. So things like Great Salt Lake, where we're losing some of that resiliency and we can't, we haven't had conditions where we've had wet year after wet year after wet year. Those just, that just has not been in the cards for us since about the year 2000. Um, we had some very dry years and again, really wet years. 
I think of this as, um, and Rob mentioned this, as increasing climate variability, where we tend, even this is shown on an annual scale, but within this we can have really wet winters sometimes. Those are hard, again, for reservoir operators to manage to try to um, reduce flood risk. And then we're going into these generally longer, drier summers. So we, we really need our water supply for people and for ecosystems like Great Salt Lake. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. This meme has shown up, is it going? Oh no. Oh well, I think we get the idea of it. So this meme has shown up, it's run across my desk like five times in the last two weeks. So I said, okay, that's a sign, and I put it in my talk. So what we wanna do, we wanna keep our eye on the ball. We don't wanna let one wet year really distract us and derail us, but we also wanna get not so myopic on any one year that we keep the big picture in mind. And it's a great clip, you guys should Google it, keep your eye on the ball, um, if, if it hasn't crossed your deck too. Dust too. All right, so now we're coming back to this, um, some, of the, some of the work that forestry, fire, and state lands have done, and they've done a, a great job of showing the lake elevations that are healthy for us. So we already know, you know, without changes from the legislature, we already know the lake levels that we need to be at. We wanna be in this optimal range in the white, in the middle there, but we're down in the red. So we know that we need to increase the lake level. So now I'm gonna talk some ways as, as a hydrologist would think about how we might get there. So I'm gonna talk some about water conservation and banking and water shepherding. And one important thing to think about is that all of these need to happen in tandem. And by the way, this is, I'm not trying to include every potential strategy in this talk. I'm talking just about a couple of them. So just keep that in mind. This isn't meant to be every single you know, promising strategy that we can include. But for things like conservation, with the ag, ag optimization program, farmers have been working really hard to conserve water. There's more money being put into that this year. We continue, we hope it will, you know, conserve a lot of water for the state. But that's not the end. Because if that was the end, then other water users can pick up that water and it never actually gets to the lake. So one way to incentivize conservation is through water banking or water marketing. And I, one reason I always, I think it might be promising is because it does incentivize conservation. So it doesn't, it becomes more of a, you know, d don't necessarily only do this because it will help the lake, but we'll keep you whole as farmers or whoever can conserve water, we'll try to keep you whole. So in this case, people would, spend money to, to buy water, to purchase water from voluntary sales, from anyone who's willing to sell some of their water. And then that water would need to be shepherded, shepherded down to the Great Salt Lake. We can't just you know say, some water's been conserved and it will magically great, get to Great Salt Lake because we know that that's not the case. So all of these sorts of solutions have, tend to go, have to go hand in hand. And that's challenging because there's no really one single bullet solution. We know that we have to in, enact a number of them all together. So with the Great Salt Lake Strike Team, we've ran some numbers. And again, this is from a very hydrologic approach. So we thought, OK, we're at 4,189 feet right now. How much water would it take to increase the lake level? And this is pretty simple using the water balance that I showed you. The equation is here on the bottom. We know that we need to increase stream flow, groundwater, precipitation times area. And then we have the lake bathymetry. So these are pretty easy calculations for us to come up with. And in these, these calculations, by the way, this is showing the total water that we do get already from stream flow and from precipitation. So I'll break this down a little bit more, just the, the conservation part in the next slide. And then we also need to ask, how fast do we want to go? How fast do we want to preserve the lake? And I think everyone would like to be there, you know, like I said, one, one wet year, but we know that's not gonna happen. Looking at numbers like this, it really shows this is probably a marathon. We need to be thinking about Great Salt Lake for many years or for decades. So you can see these numbers, I'm not gonna read every one. So we have how much water to raise the lake in five years or 10 years and 20 years, and then how much to maintain Great Salt Lake at that level. And now let's separate 
the additional conservation we need to get to those numbers. Because like I said, some, some stream flow is already getting to the lake, some precipitation is already, already getting to the lake, some groundwater. So here we have some ranges because we don't know if the next five years are gonna be very wet or very dry. Probably Rob could help us narrow this down so we know what's coming a little bit more. Um, and so we could say, you know, to raise the lake to 41.92 in five years, we might need anyone for anywhere from an extra 100,000 acre feet per year to 700 acre, 700,000 acre feet per year. And this helps us be able to plan. And again, this is, not so much on the policy side, but purely as, a, as looking at the hydrology of the lake. So this is focused purely on increasing stream, stream flow through conservation. And now I want to bring up a study that I did with an economist, Eric Edwards, a number of years ago. And we looked at water markets and how much they would cost. Um, and so we wanted to look at we looked at the marginal value of water. So how much um, water users pay for their water, or in the case of agriculture, the, the productivity, how much money they make from say like an acre foot of water. And then we could put this into models and we wanted to say, if we wanted to bring water down to Great Salt Lake, how, how much money would it cost? So the first thing we did is say, let's assume that the state or federal government were to mandate curtailments. They were to say everybody has to conserve. This is showing 11% or 20% or 29% of their water. We did a bit of a sensitivity analysis. Looking at that darkest gray bar in each figure, that's that's assuming that that there was no water markets that that the government just said we're going to mandate water um, water conservation or we're going to curtail water by some percentage. And then we said, what if we added markets? So some people could conserve water more easily. Some people um, could, would, wouldn't want to conserve any water, and that would be their prerogative. And we noticed that the cost came down a good deal for the same amount of water. So this, to me, this is one of the reasons that I like, uh, or I think, I think water trading might be promising along with conservation and water shepherding. Just to be clear of what's shown in this water, this is um, costs of, of water for urban uses or reductions in profits for farmers. It's not the cost of implementing programs or um, kind, of, kind of maintaining these sorts of programs. But we can see that this, is, this might be a pretty promising strategy because when we think about places like Mona Lake, as Kevin mentioned, so far the city of LA has spent over $2 billion and it's estimated to be more like $3.5 billion to, bring, to mitigate dust in Owens Lake. That's not to restore a lake. That's not to have any of the benefits of the lake. That's just to prevent dust. All right, in this slide, I stole this idea from, from Jake Sarago. These are made up numbers and the focus is on the idea. So the idea here is that we need to give up some things. We, we maybe can't have everything. So this is where hydrology ends and water policy and, and you know, social analyses start and preference analyses type starting. But we can think about what, what do we wanna have in the state? Do we wanna have tons of urban growth kind of unchecked urban growth? Do we want to maintain agriculture? And I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. Every, every survey I've seen talking to farmers, talking to water managers, talking to everyday Utahns, everyone wants to keep agriculture in the state. It's just a matter of how we do it and to what extent. Thinking about mineral extraction and thinking about Great Salt Lake preservation. We know we need to get more to the Great Salt Lake and so we need to think about which pieces do we keep. And by the way, I say that, that this is a part for policy and that's true, but this is a place where science can help. It can lay out what our options are. So we can go into this with really wide, our eyes wide open and understand our trade-offs. So my last slide here, so the big points, if you turn, tuned out for the last 30 minutes or so, the big points that I want to make here are that first consumptive uses are largely the decline of Great Salt Lake. And that's a good thing too, because we can change that. We know we need to deliver water to the Great Salt Lake. So not only conserve water, but deliver it to Great Salt Lake. We should leverage wet years. We don't want to let these wet years go by. That being said, we don't want to merely hope for wet years. Hope isn't a strategy. We can hope for them, but we should also be planning. And so to me, that means using these wet years and try to think about how much water can we get to Great Salt Lake in these types of years, because that's going to make conservation on the dry years that much easier. We're going to be able to ease up on the dry years if we really can, can maximize these sorts of wet years. 
And then keep it up, that's that's maybe a little slangy, but we but this is a long-term solution. When I think I, I'm a scientist, but if I was if I were a legislator and trying to think about policies that we need to put in place that need to stay there for decades, that would that would make me probably stressed out. We all want that magic bullet of just do this, just sign this legislation and our problem will be solved. And I don't think we have that in Great Salt Lake. I think that those times have ended and this is gonna take many years of hard work. In this case, I've talked about water conservation, banking, and shepherding. They go hand in hand for Great Salt Lake. They're probably part of a portfolio. I just highlighted a couple potential solutions here. In our Great Salt Lake strike team policy assessment, we've outlined lots more solutions. So if you're listening to this and thinking, I hate the idea of water banking, that's great. Let's look for some other solutions too. And we've started to outline those. Um, there's many state reports um, and, and other state agency reports, and they've done the same thing. So lots of ideas are out there. Um, and then we know it's cheaper to preserve Great Salt Lake now than it is to, to try to restore it later. And we're starting last summer, we we're really starting to hit these tipping points and we know we don't wanna go past them when it's gonna cost us much, much more money. So with that, I'm not sure if we have time or, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> I got word there's a few minutes for questions. This is working, I think. Okay. Um, so we have several great questions from um, our virtual participants. The first is, um, what do we know about groundwater consumption and how that might be influencing flows to the lake? Ooh, that's a great question. So the question was, what do we know about groundwater consumption? And how might it be influencing flows? I don't have the answer to that. It's a topic of a lot of research. Um, some of the studies have shown that that 2 to 3% estimate might be a little bit low, maybe it's closer to 10%, but that, that work is still being done. And, and was, as to the use of groundwater, and I would put with that the recharge, I would say those are really promising areas of research and hopefully someone else in this symposium can speak to that. Great. Um, another question is about um, uh, water markets. Are people taking advantage of market incentives like water banking? This is actually happening, and what are um, what are the barriers to this route to conservation? Yes, yeah, so Utah had the pilot program, um, putting in some water banks. I know in some places they've fallen apart. In Cache Valley, it's my understanding that not enough people wanted to do transactions, um, so that's not very promising. Um, I think that there's just about to be a report released on Weber and Price. Um, but I do know in other Western states, water markets are put into place and they have been for decades and have been successful at adding flexibility for both farmers and to manage water for environmental places. And so, so some of my hope comes from thinking about other places like Arizona and New Mexico and California that have a pretty long history of water markets and have, um, have had some externalities. There's some, so some third party problems, but so there's some things that we can learn, um, but there's also some, some promise there that this might be a potential where people who want to sell water could do so, could get some of the money back for their trouble, um, and we might be able to reallocate some water to Great Salt Lake. Great. Um, there's a question about a uh, potential solution. Uh, what about pumping saline water from the aquifer uh, under and around the Great Salt Lake? Would that be a solution? Yeah, so there's a lot of, um, I call them kind of infrastructure solutions. So in this case, the question was about pumping water from a deep aquifer, pumping saline water and bringing it to Great Salt Lake. Um, so, so that we don't increase the salinity of the lake farther, we would probably need to pump that water, desalinate it, and then put it into Great Salt Lake. Um, so ideas like that, they might have promise. I haven't looked at, at all of them. I've, I've looked at some pipelines. My one word of caution would be, you know, we, we are looking for solutions that we can put in place quickly. So some of these large infrastructure projects can take a long time to build and can be very costly. So that's an, a nice place where cost benefit analyses can add a lot of information for us. Great, okay, one final question. What is the timeline uh, for the dire effects reference today? Uh, when might we cross the threshold of no return? And what consequences might be viewed uh, once we have? 
Yeah, so the question was kind of when, I think ecologically, when do we point past the point of no return? And we were towing at that. You know, when salinity in the south arm and in our freshest bay was around 18%, we're towing at, at that point where we can't easily cross back over. Luckily, we have done some things. We have put up a berm to, tr to keep all of our fresh water in the south arm. We're getting a nice wet year. Those things are all going to help us. Um, I know that there's other biologists that are speaking later in this session, and so I think they could speak more to the biology. But, but the short answer is, is, is that we're towing it, and we really don't want to cross it. We're, we're there now this last summer. Great. Thank you, Professor Knoll. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll take our break and we will resume at uh, 1045 on the dot. 